Okay, this is Kohalen's Adventures interview with Matteo Mancuso here at Alva's showroom upstairs. Thanks for doing this, man. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much. I first saw you because Matt Lindsay, the owner of this place, grabbed me by the shoulders at the boutique uh, booth last year for, in front of Dingwall mm -hmm. bass guitars and said, you got to see this guy. He took me over. <laughs> I recorded about three minutes and 33 seconds of you just going crazy on the guitar. And that, that just shot things off. <laughs> and after that segment, uh, you told me about your your acrylic fingernails on three fingers. Ah, yeah, yeah. And then natural thumb, and they're your picking style from that. So th that was last year at the last, show. Yeah, right? uh -huh. yeah, at the Bachi booth. Is it Bachi or Bachi? Uh, Bachi. Bachi booth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I've seen you several times in there on this year. <laughs> uh, yeah. How has your life changed in that one year? Well, it changed a lot, uh, especially after the Beato interview came out. I had a lot of exposure, of course. And, uh, you know, it was, it was amazing, of course. It was incredibly amazing. And sometimes you feel overwhelmed, honestly, because one thing that changed now is that I feel the, you know, I have to play guitar even in times where I don't want to because I have to keep in shape, I have so many concerts right now and uh, it didn't really happen before, you know? So uh, there was a time where I was more relaxed about my guitar playing. There wasn't the need of being at 100% every time, but now you have so much exposure and people are always looking at you and you you feel more responsibility, you know? I feel that sometimes I have to play guitar, even if I don't want to. So that was a big thing that changed, because, you know, yeah, I just feel more responsibility now. So I just, actually I practice more now rather than before. Uh, but, you know, it feels amazing. At the end of the day, we are on the entertainment business. So uh, one thing that I like is that you are not a surgeon, you know. If you if you screw up, nobody dies. So yeah. always, the thing I always remind myself is to have fun because I, I consider myself really lucky because this doesn't really feel like work, you know. I just go around, see new places, and play guitar with my friends. So if if this is work, then I want to work forever, you know. You seem to have a lot of fun on stage with with Giancarlo and uh, Ricardo. Yeah. And it's just. There's a mesh that you can see happening in the communication between the three of you. You all listen well to each other. Yeah, yeah. Um, how did that grouping come together? Well, it was because, first of all, we have Ricardo, we know each other since a long time. So, uh, he's, he is a close friend of mine. Uh, also with Gianluca, but Gianluca is uh, a little bit new than Ricardo. So, I, I know him thanks to him thanks to Ricardo and it, it all started back in 2017 my first trio was actually called Snips and we were playing a lot of covers jazz fusion covers like the chicken Spain this kind of standards so you're still doing Spain right? yeah, yeah we still do still do Spain yeah. and the chicken also and but then we didn't really have the maturity to continue a project because we were only playing covers and then Ricardo moved to Milan and then things started to you know happen a little bit less frequently so uh, in 2020 I started another trio it was called the Matteo Malacusa trio and uh, we were playing actually original composition and then in 2022 I actually started to you know uh, frequent more Ricardo, we were seeing each other more frequently and we just decided to play together again in 2022 and that's when the, this trio started actually and uh, you know the chemistry we have is I think the key to have the chemistry is that we don't take ourselves too seriously uh, and that's that's a that's a thing that maybe a lot of people don't understand even if you are playing serious music like jazz fusion instrumental crazy stuff 
that doesn't mean that you are, you don't you don't have fun with it, you know. Even if it is pretty serious music. So I think the key is whatever you play, keep in mind that if you're playing with friends, it's an incredible opportunity to have fun. So uh, that's a thing that we always have in mind, especially with Ricardo. You know, he's a pretty He's an incredible, incredibly good band member because you, you just look at him and you, 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 you know you see him happy whatever yeah. he's doing. So it's a big plus for me. Uh, well, it seems project. like the musicians are pretty well matched to you uh, yeah. on level. So there, there's an ease of listening to each other and playing stuff. Tell me about the album, the journey, because it seems like you've been on a journey, and it seems a fitting title for the album. And yeah. the album itself has so many different fields. Yeah. yeah, first of all, I wanted to make an album that wasn't associated with just one style, one genre. So I tried to make, you know, one jazz song, one rock song, one fusion song, and that's how the journey basically came out. I wanted to pack into one album of my main influences, so that was the concept behind it. And, you know, I first started, I, I really like to compose with classical guitar because I feel that some things are just nicer with, so with cool. classical, yeah. So actually the first song I uh, composed with the, for the journey, the album, were with the classical guitar. Then I composed also the electric stuff. And yeah, I think, it, it's a pretty good album because it's very diverse, so you can like maybe the first four songs and maybe you don't like the, the last four. But I, I think there's there's a little bit for everyone, even for like jazz lovers, there are some songs that are very jazz oriented, like Polyphemal, Blues for John. Blues for I mean, John not, not straight jazz, it's yeah. always on the fusion side, but you know, there are some pretty there's, jazz There's a little songs. Schofield in there, I think. Yeah, yeah, a lot of John Schofield, yeah. Um, I also more rock oriented songs like Drop D. Um, but actually, one of my favorites is Falcon Flight. Because, oh, thank you. I wasn't so. really able to, um, you know, put a, a label on it. You know, it's not jazz, it's not fusion. So, it was maybe one of the most original songs from the album. Because the other ones are derivative, you know. The, the, that drop these mm. rock polyphemy jazz from the 80s, maybe a little bit more future. Falcon has, has a, a journey within it, musically. Sorry. Falcon has a journey within it. Yeah, mm. yeah. So it was kind of the first tunes where I thought, okay, this is something. So uh, for the second album, I would like to go in that direction, you know, Falcon Flight. And There's something about leaving home. I forget the exact okay. title of it, but. It's a little melancholy to it, but it, it's. Yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah, it's it's almost like you know, uh, it felt like a, a trip, on when you have to go or unknown city maybe, and there's this kind of mystery behind it. So, uh, at, at least to me, it feels like that. Yeah. Covid when that hit. How did that hit for you, and what was the the good thing that came out of it? Well, for sure the good thing is that I was able to put a lot of videos on YouTube because I had so much free time, we were all at home. And so for me it was actually positive because it all started with COVID actually, getting more exposure, uh, being like more well known in the scene. and. And that was because back in 2019, 2018, yeah, I was doing videos also with my trio, but I wasn't very consistent with it. It was like one video every two months because I was, I was always studying at the conservatory, at the music school. So I was more concentrating on learning stuff rather than being a content creator on social media. So I wasn't really interested in that. And when the pandemic, uh, came out and um, I think I saw this opportunity simply because I didn't know what to do at home and I was just you know so school guitar. had stopped completely school right? stopped yeah. completely uh, we started to do some you know 
Skype lessons and this kind of stuff for the yeah. school, online lessons. So uh, I was really bored at home. So I thought, well, I guess I will record some of my practice routines. That's how some of the videos came out, actually. I was practicing maybe on a blues uh, and I recorded the blues shuffle in G video on my YouTube channel. And then I, I started also to, you know, one of the first videos I put out in 2020 was a version of Abona by Jaco. Abona, yeah. yeah. Was actually maybe the first video I put out on YouTube. That was like one month before the pandemic. Because people, I saw that people were more interested on my trio stuff rather than just me playing with the back and shots, you know. So I was kind of, I wanted to do more of the trio stuff, but then the pandemic hit. Yeah. So, and yeah, I think for me it was an opportunity. It wasn't, of course, it was a bad time because you cannot go out. Uh, it was, you know, you, you didn't have, you know. The, the chance to play with other people and, and for me it was that's you know, essential yeah that's essential especially in jazz so yeah but i took this opportunity just to be more consistent with videos and that paid out in the end yeah there's a question i, I generally ask all the time but i do a terrible irish accent from but it's from the movie the commitments who are your influences who are your influences who are your influences who, who influenced you musically when you were starting off on guitar, at wow. least initially? Well, the initial influences, I think, uh, were most of the time rock guys. So I started with the electric guitar and my very first big influences was, was actually Jimi Hendrix. So it was my very first big influence. Richie Blackmore, a lot of the Purple Tunes, Led Zeppelin, ACDC, that's why I bought a uh, Gibson SG actually, I, was a, I, I still am a big fan of Angus Young. And so my very first influences were very rock blues oriented. And then when I was around 14 years old, I started to play more classical guitar and I started to listen to some more music. Was that influenced by your dad? Because he was... Yeah, I, I think my dad was also an influence because I, I heard, heard him all the time playing at home and actually some of my lines are really similar to his lines because you know my ear was like absorbing his guitar yeah. playing in a way yeah. even if it was just always there so it, it was always play. there so there, there were some leaks that i stole from him in a passive way let's say but he never actually showed me oh you should do this or you should use the scale it wasn't really like that he was always like a listening guy. You should listen to this guy, you should listen to the other one. And then when we played together, it was like just jamming, you know? He, he showed me, you know, the, uh, some chords. I remember he showed me the first, my first dominant seven chord. It was this position here, uh, starting with the fifth, fifth string. So I, I remember these little things, but it wasn't really a teacher, you know. He showed me some like little pieces of information, and then I go in deep with that information also thanks to the internet, actually. So I was a really, I still I am. A really, time to be alive with the internet. Yeah, yeah, what a time yeah. to be alive because you know you have YouTube, you have Facebook, you have a lot of informations available, and I I was so happy that I I. I, I can use YouTube like a tool, you know? And it was really positive for me because I can slow down tunes, I can see other people, other guitar players playing from the other parts of the world. So that was a big part of my, uh, you know, build up as a guitar player, I think, yeah. I had been told, and I don't know if this is rumor or not, that you had learned the entire Django Reinhardt catalog. Is that accurate? Uh, or no? no, that's not true. Did no. you study Django much? Yeah, I studied Django, but not as much as a gypsy jazz player. You know, there are people that are studying Django. They know Django way better than me. So, I, Django is an influence for sure. He, he influenced me in some ways. The Hot Club of, of Paris, that, that period? Yeah, that, that kind of feel. Even, even the last albums were 
he actually didn't play the jazz mongoose guitar, but he played the electric, the first electric mm -hmm. guitars. And here you can hear the, like, the, the first evolution of Django, I think. And I always say that if he would have lived more, he would have also revolutionized even more the jazz guitar. Like, you know, even like West Hendrix, if he had lived, he was going towards the jazz direction. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So a lot of people, they take Django like only the first uh, kind of period. And it's okay, it's like the, the jazz, the most manush period of Django, mm -hmm. but it's not, Django is not only that one. And when you hear people like Angelo de Barre or Bire de la Grande, they also have a lot of uh, different influences. It's not only Django, especially Birelli, there's a lot of bebop, there's a lot of classical music also. So people that are influenced by Django, there's not only the, like the swing manush mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Yeah. So yeah, in order to innovate, you, you have to search for the stuff. Yeah? What what grabs your attention musically these days? Who who influences you now, or who do you listen to now? Well, I like to first of all I try to not listen to only guitar players. That's an habit I had for a long time. But you know, if you listen to only guitar players, your music will eventually be too guitar oriented. So what I listen now is artist well, I, I try to listen to music where the guitar is not the main protagonist so you have like a clear picture of what music should be actually you know and i i like guitar oriented albums you know i, I really like uh, guitar oriented uh, stuff but that's i mean in order to innovate there's no need uh, uh, right now if i you know uh, if you came up uh, if you come up with another like guitar hero kind of stuff like Joe Satriani, Steve Vai, Ingvi, Mountains and stuff, they have been done it. They they just done it in the eighties, in the nineties. So there's no point to do a thing that just has been done thirty years ago, you know, even more. So I think listen to non guitar music is really essential in order to open your mind a little bit. I really like these guys from Argentina. It's, they are called Aka Seca Trio. And uh, it's a trio, classical guitar, piano, and, uh, uh, and bass, I think. Yeah, yeah, classical guitar, piano, and bass. And they are really amazing. I mean, the, their music is like, uh, classical Argentinian kind of music, but with a lot of fusion, a lot of uh, harmony from Pat Metini oriented, you know? So I really like this kind of guys. And even Pat Metini himself is more like a composer rather than just a guitar player, you know? And he's also got a wide range of sounds from the early days yeah, to now. Yeah. It's like, which which Metini period are you talking about? Yeah, yeah, you know? Especially the Pat Metini group, Still Life Talking, it's yeah. a perfect example. Letter from New Chautauqua. Yeah, yeah. Also, his works with Michael Brecker are also pretty remarkable. And a lot of, you know, Jacob Collier stuff are really amazing because of that. So, uh, yeah, I try to listen to non-guitar oriented music, yeah. Okay. Well, I don't want to take up too much of your time because you're getting yeah. the call sign. Yeah, yeah. And you got to eat and rest and relax. But thank you yeah, so yeah. much for your time. Thank you. And I appreciate it. Always that. a pleasure to have you. Yeah. yeah.